Now, if one were to con study the diversity of life, um, it might be odd that one would then mention viruses, because isn't it true that viruses aren't alive? Um, well, yes, we could come up with a set of definitions. These are the characteristics of life. Viruses do not meet all of those. Those are not alive. But that being said, um, certainly there's a lot of them. All right. Now, when we think of a lot of them, think of the carbon that is tied up here. Now, viruses are small, but just look at a milliliter of solution uh, from you know, these various aquatic environments can contain billions of uh, viral particles. This is just you know, an incredible um, diversity. So a lot of the carbon of the world, a lot of the DNA of the world, a lot of the protein in the world is tied up in uh, viruses. And although it sounds odd, one could actually speak of viral ecology. What does, what does that mean? Well, let's just, for example, take the viruses which infect bacteria, which I'll get back to in a second. So they are a major cause of death of you know, bacteria. When the bacteria die, they burst. This then liberates the molecules which have been inside the bacteria. This then makes those molecules available then for um, other organisms to take up. So these uh, viruses are playing a role in the cycling of nutrients throughout food webs and uh, the like. Viruses sometimes accidentally move some of the DNA from the host into another host. So viruses sometimes accidentally take some of these yellow bacterial genes by accident, not the white viral genes, put them into a new, um, a new viral uh, a package and then transmit it from one organism to the next. And so uh, some of an organism's genome may actually be of viral origin. That applies to humans. Right, there are viruses which insert themselves into the host genome. We'll get to HIV uh, and mention others uh, a little later. Um, but actually, sometimes the DNA stays. So we can find little sections of the human genome that seems to be uh, DNA which viruses inserted into the human genome ages before there were humans, going back to early mammals or early primates, etc. cetera. Um, but nevertheless, when we ask uh, about you know organisms uh, genomes certainly uh, viruses you know have a role that uh, they play in transmitting genetic information from one individual to uh, another here's a little animal called a rotifer that's a filter feeder so it's sucking up water and then extracting nutrients uh, from this now while it's primarily looking for say cyanobacteria and bacteria it's also getting viruses here's a sponge that's filter feeding ocean uh, water and getting its nutrients from what it extracts. It certainly gets uh, viruses in uh, that. Um, and even myself, uh, I've got this ancient mechanism uh, that used to be used for feeding. Now, like whenever I inhale, if there's, you know, particles in the air, it gets caught in mucus and I sweep it towards my stomach. The reason I do that is to prevent harmful things from uh, getting into my lungs. But actually it ends up in my stomach, my stomach digested. So I actually um, take the viruses which I inhale and then I actually then absorb you know, their DNA and their um, amino acids which I then use for food. And, and so viruses, they have a role in ecology. Um, and so whether they fit into this box, we've said, you know, to be alive, you have to have these traits uh, and anything that doesn't have the, those traits are not alive. Viruses are clearly, you know, there's a middle ground in there. And, and so even if we're going to focus on the diversity of life, we should mention uh, viruses. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, viruses are so omnipresent that they infect just about everything that uh, we know of. Viruses do not just infect animals. Um, there are viruses which infect plants. Uh, there are viruses which infect fungi. So we could even come up with different names. So myco, M-Y-C-O is the prefix for fungi. Mycophage uh, or mycophage could be uh, the viruses which infect um, fungi. Uh, there are bacteriophage, bacteriophage, 
uh, which uh, infect bacteria. And then there are some viruses which only affect, infect archaea, you know, that kingdom of bacteria. There are uh, um, viruses which only infect uh, the blue-green algae, cyanobacteria. Uh, uh, and so viruses are certainly um, uh, quite uh, diverse. And once, uh, once again, just about every organism uh, that uh, we know of uh, can be infected by some sort of virus. There are even examples where virus can interfere with other virus. So it's not quite infection, but just like, you know, humans can get viruses, bacteria can get viruses, even viruses can get viruses. So here's a big meme virus, which I'll mention again in a second. There is um, a little virus which interferes with its infection, known as virophage. Uh, and so um, even viruses uh, can be adversely affected by other uh, uh, viruses. Uh, so viruses vary. Uh, some of them are, you know, are very large and actually can have more genes than simple bacteria, right? And so viruses can be larger than the smallest bacteria. Viruses can be more genetically complex than uh, the small the, than the simplest uh, bacteria. So that is certainly unexpected. And if we were going to try to say viruses are not alive, viruses are this, viruses are that, um, we actually might have to make exceptions because once again, viruses vary quite a great deal. Um, and some such as the Mimi virus and other nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses, um, they might actually warrant being put in a separate category from other viruses. In general, this is how viruses uh, operate. Uh, first, viruses have um, a protein uh, a coat or capsid of some sort um, that then recognizes a specific receptor on the host cell. Now, because this binding has to be specific, this is why some viruses only infect bacteria and some only infect plants and some only infect you know, certain animals and some only infect you know, humans. When I talk about coronavirus at the very end, um, there are in the family of coronaviruses, you know, some uh, members which are infecting only invertebrates, you know, some which are known in, in bats. And so it's a, a question, you know, is, you know, the capability of, you know, these proteins, which were recognizing protein, uh, surface proteins in bats, to also then recognize something in humans and kind of jump species. Um, so uh, the virus that attaches uh, to uh, this uh, cell uh, surface, thanks to that, you know, specific recognition of you know, the viral proteins to, say, a receptor on the host cell. At that point, the virus uh, uh, somehow gets its nucleic acid inside the host cell. Now, maybe it injects it, and especially in the viruses which infect bacteria, because bacteria have a cell wall, the nucleic acid has to be uh, injected. Um, but in other cases, say, like in humans and the coronavirus, you know, the human cell may actually take the virus particle inside itself, and then the virus uh, nucleic acid is liberated there, and I'll go through this. This nucleic acid can vary. So some viruses use double-stranded DNA, some use single-stranded DNA, some use double-stranded RNA, some use single-stranded RNA. So viruses, uh, you know, vary in the nucleic acid uh, that uh, they use. Some viruses get inside the host cell and then automatically try to convert all of the host machinery into machinery now that creates new virus. So they try to stop the cell from doing cell tasks and now get it to make new viral nucleic acid, new viral protein capsids. The nucleic acid gets packaged into the protein capsids and then the viruses uh, causes the cell to burst. And this then releases more viruses, which can infect more cells. This is what we see in what's called a lytic virus. So lytic viruses, they attempt to infect a, uh, a host uh, cell, make a lot of virus and burst the cell, thus liberating uh, the viral uh, particles. Well, that is one way that viruses can work. Other viruses are called temperate viruses, where instead of always bursting the cell, sometimes their nucleic acid 
then gets inserted in the host genome. So this is a bacteria and it has a circular chromosome. Uh, and so then the viral uh, nucleic acid is now part of the host chromosome. And every time the bacteria then replicates itself, then it now um, uh, replicates the viral and nucleic acid along with it. Now, temperate viruses can become lytic some point in the future. All right, but the point is they can more or less hide inside the uh, host, um, uh, in uh, the host, uh, uh, in the host uh, chromosome, uh, and replicate that way. And there are some viruses which infect humans that way. So herpes viruses can hide inside a host nucleus. So if I say get a cold sore. And then a while later, maybe after another sunburn or something, I get another cold sore the same spot. And I ask, what are the odds of getting the cold sore in the exact same spot again? Well, an answer might be that somewhere I have a nerve cell that a herpes virus has infected. And that every now and then it's going to activate and work its way down the axon and now then infect the cells in the same spot where that axon ended as the last infection. HIV is another example of this. HIV, uh, when it enters the uh, host cell, doesn't burst it. And um, its uh, genome uh, can then be hidden inside the human genome where it can stay dormant for years. And so thus someone um, can have HIV and not be going into a full-blown HIV uh, infection because the uh, HIV uh, nucleic acid is actually hiding in the, uh, the host human chromosome to be activated uh, later. Um, now, uh, HIV does infect uh, cells, uh, reacting only with certain receptors. That's why only CD4 cells, like T helper cells, uh, can be infected uh, with uh, HIV. Um, one difference is that um, some viruses, have a membrane around their outer protein capsid. And one of the ways they can get that is by budding off of a cell. So when HIV leaves a human cell, it doesn't burst it. It kind of buds off from the cell membrane and then is surrounded by uh, a little bit of the human cell membrane uh, as, it, um, uh, as it goes. Uh, and so, uh, clearly, viruses are important in uh, ecology. They certainly affect lots of aspects of physiology. Um, and there are new viruses which uh, uh, occasionally arise. So the Zika virus, which can cause uh, microcephaly uh, and can be transmitted by uh, mosquito bites, um, that is a, certainly a, uh, a concern. You know, so for example, a woman could be born uh, it could be bitten by a uh, mosquito carrying the Zika virus, and this could result in you know, permanent changes to the size of the brain of, uh, of uh, her child. So you know, clearly, you know, we humans are certainly uh, uh, worried uh, about uh, viruses. And perhaps nowhere is that more evident, at least right now, um, with the coronaviruses. Now, just like we classify living things into taxonomic groups, we say, ah, oh, you're in an order, you're in a suborder, you're in a family. We can do the same with viruses. So once again, they're not alive. But if we're to understand them, you know, they're certainly not rocks. They're certainly not inorganic in that sense. They evolve. Um, and, and, and so, you know, rather than having the living, non-living, maybe, you know, we have to admit that viruses occupy this middle uh, ground. And so there's a virus order, nidovirales, which then diversified as mutations occurred, new viruses uh, evolved, and it then formed a number of families of virus, including the coronavirus family. Then the coronavirus family evolved. Uh, and so just like, you know, in the carnivores, you have, you know, uh, the cat branch, the dog and bear branch, you know, you know, et cetera. There are different uh, types of coronaviruses. Some cause common colds. Many infect animals other than uh, humans and are not known to transmit uh, diseases in uh, uh, humans. Uh, one causes MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and then one branch not only uh, uh, causes the original 
uh, SARS, covirus, uh, uh, coronavirus, um, but also then uh, the new uh, strain which has caused the, the global pandemic. So I just have a little bit of information here. Uh, the uh, first uh, SARS uh, coronavirus uh, was uh, first identified in late 2002 uh, when apparently it jumped species. So this is a virus which occurs in nature. It occurs in bats. All right, so bats have coronavirus, and apparently bats are really good at spreading viruses just because, you know, they tend to, you know, uh, spend the night and over winter in big groups, breathing the same air in a confined space. So that just makes it easy for them, you know, to spread it among themselves. And then other animals can live in the same cave or tree trunk or whatever. And so then viruses apparently can move from bats uh, to other nocturnal uh, animals. And so I uh, then have this little video which uh, traces the outbreak of the first coronavirus, which was known in late uh, 2002, and then continued uh, through 2003 with a case coming from a lab in 2004. So it was confined to that time period. Um, in the year 2012, for the first time, there was a new coronavirus where apparently it had moved from bats to camels. And thus in uh, the Middle East, uh, there is a very deadly form. I think the, um, the uh, uh, mortality rate uh, is in the 30%. Um, this doesn't seem to transfer from person to person, but rather uh, uh, affects humans which are uh, around infected um, uh, camels. Um, and then in uh, late, uh, 2019, apparently uh, a new strain then uh, jumped species going from bats, which is once again where most coronaviruses uh, uh, occur more than in any other uh, group. Um, and then maybe to another, you know, uh, organism, uh, and but then ultimately then infected uh, uh, humans. Uh, now, uh, the following videos go into a bit more neat, deep, uh, uh, a detail than is, uh, you know, required, uh, you know, in, uh, for a, a summary understanding of this. Um, however, um, uh, coronavirus uh, then infects cells that have a specific receptor. So just like I said, viruses tend to only interact with certain cells that have a specific uh, receptor. And the receptor in humans is known as ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So I give a little background into that. But once again, there's a specific uh, receptor. Apparently, there's some other uh, proteins along uh, the way that can also help uh, facilitate uh, uh, this. Because apparently, what the virus wants is it wants to liberate its nucleic acid inside the host cell. And so it's looking for a signal in which to do that. And human cells, which then digest some of the proteins, so react to a viral protein and then split it, apparently that's key, all right? And so the virus has a number of proteins in its, um, in its envelope that's part lipid, part protein. Um, and so, therefore, it's looking for human enzymes, which, uh, you know, react with the proteins, break it up just a little bit. Uh, now, it seems that uh, just like HIV, uh, the virus, at least as far as the last I've read, the main port of entry is rather than coming right into the cell membrane, it uh, is then engulfed in a little vesicle called a, or um, a little membrane bag called a vesicle. So the cell says, aha, I'm going to take this into myself. I'm going to make a little membrane bag. Now, you know, cells can do that and eat bacteria, for example. But apparently with coronavirus, that's what it wants. It wants the human cell membrane to engulf it and bring it inside the cell. And as this then becomes more acidic, uh, the human cell thinks it's now going to make it acidic and break this down. Um, that's actually a trigger uh, for uh, the virus. Um, and so, I, once again, I go into, you know, some of the, the genetics of this, uh, perhaps um, uh, more, uh, you know, detail than we actually uh, need just for a cursory uh, understanding of this. Um, but uh, suffice it then to say that 
the uh, virus replicates its own um, nucleic acid. This is an RNA virus. And so uh, it uses the host machinery to replicate uh, the, uh, its own molecules, which include a viral replicase, which then go around making more and more of the instructions to make uh, the viral RNA. And then in membranes, uh, other molecules of the viral RNA uh, then make the viral uh, proteins. And then all of this then, uh, then is packaged to make the, um, uh, uh, the viral particle. So the, the virus makes a couple of proteins. Uh, one of uh, the proteins helps to then attach the, uh, the viral RNA onto the viral um, uh, envelope uh, and help in uh, its packaging. Uh, and then once it does that, uh, it can bud off from the surface, uh, having you know lipid already in its membrane coming from the uh, the membrane compartment where it was made. So coronavirus isn't a, a lytic uh, uh, virus. So uh, once again, uh, viruses are not alive. All right, and we could you know say, ah, oh, because they're not alive, they don't belong in you know a discussion of the diversity of life. But then we would be missing out because certainly they affect living things, um, and then even affect you know ecological relationships even cause disease. And so this was an overview of you know, some of the diversity in viruses uh, with that end.